Okay, I've got the red button there saying that it's recording right now. Um, so what I'm going to do is I am going to go to the PowerPoint and get started. We're going to start out with USAFs. Let me start my presentation here. Okay, um, and so uh, I have a little mini celebration here because this is officially our last time that we're doing calendar year and closing for classic. And so oh, believe me, we're just as happy as you guys are about uh, sunsetting classic and just focusing in on one type of um, software. And so, um, so I think it's cause for celebration for all of us on this. And so what we're going to cover here in the USAS portion is just our calendar year in review uh, closing checklist. The filing dates are the same as last year. And we do have links there just to show you where that information's at on the IRS website. So I have one for the 1099 NEC and the 1099 miscellaneous. And then after we're done with review, we'll go through the TR 1099 submission, um, same as last year as well. So no big changes. Um, we do have some changes in the tape file um, that are behind the scenes to be submitted to the IRS fire system. Um, I'll talk about that JIRA issue here a little bit later, um, but, uh, and just a couple other things regarding that. But that's basically what we're going to cover in a nutshell here. So, <laughs> and I see some yippee, yays about this. Yeah, believe me, I'm glad this is the last year too for Classic. Okay, so we got to put our Classic screen hats on uh, for a minute here. Um, the vendor 10 is located in Ben's screen. So if you're in USAS web, you don't see it in there. It's just um, in Venn screen, and I've got it highlighted here as to where it's at. And so they just want to make sure that that tin type is there. Um, so obviously, you've been using the same vendors um, every year. You've already put this into place, or the districts have already entered this. But for any new vendors that came on this calendar year, um, they have to just make sure that that tin type is um, labeled. So either um, a social security number or EIN number. So it's either gonna be an S or an N that they label in that field. And if they don't, when they run the 1099 program, they'll get an error at the end of the run um, saying that this particular vendor doesn't have a tin type. And so, um, and also it's included on the 1099 report. So they'll, when they're reviewing that report, they'll see there as well that they need to go back in to this vendor in Venn screen, um, add the tin type, and then rerun the 1099s, and that should clean it up. Verifying your 1099 data. Um, you can use the Venn SSN program to do that. Um, so in here, there's a few options they can choose from. Option four is the one that's most commonly used here because it has, it will create a report of the 1099 vendors with the year-to-date activity meeting the IRS requirements, which is, I think, $600 for everything, but I think royalty, I think that's $10. And so they can run that and review. Um, they can also go in and run option six, but that's going to include all 1099 vendors regardless of your date activity. So that's gonna catch every 1099 vendor that's been uh, labeled as 1099 with a 1099 type. So it's not gonna be looking at the year to date amounts. Um, it's just gonna pull them all. And then option five in Venn SSN is for non-1099 vendors. So they could use this option to check to see if there are vendors that are not labeled as 1099 vendors, but have a year-to-date activity of $600 or more. Um, this is maybe just a way for them to double check that they didn't miss um, entering a 1099 type for a vendor that's supposed to be a 1099 vendor. Um, so they can definitely use this option just to 
just to verify that they've got everything they need. Because if they don't, you know, we usually get a message from them in February saying, I forgot to do something for this vendor. And that's where, you know, you guys have already submitted or they, you know, their information to the IRS. So they'd have to do like a correction uh, on paper to get that information uh, to the IRS. So I guess using trying out option five here is not a bad idea. And this is what the VAN SSN report looks like. Um, so it's just basically showing you um, the vendor address information, the SSN or EIN, and the year to date amounts. So these obviously are their calendar to date amounts. So unfortunately, this report doesn't have the um, TIN type, um, whether it's an E, um, but you know, according to the SSN number, you may be able to figure out that you know some of these are you know EIN versus SSN. But yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't include that if the if it's marked um, with the TIN type E or or S. So again, but they will get notified when they run the F ten eighty nine report, telling them if they're missing one. And just a heads up too, with the F-1099 program that they run, they can run that as many times as they want. It's not just a one and done. So they can you know, go out there and run it, see what's out there for 1099s and see if it does generate any errors. They can clean that up and then run it again as many times as they need to before they actually are ready to officially run their 1099s for the year. The uh, vendor names, if the vendor uses a different name for 1099 reporting, it's to be placed in the, on the second name field um, in the vendor record. So what happens then is they have to put in 1099 colon and then followed by the IRS name. I have a screenshot here on that. So, um, and so what the F1099 program does is it goes out there and finds that, strips off the 1099 colon and uses the name on that second name field as the primary name on the 1099 report and submission file. So here's an example. So we have Fran Smith who does um, consulting work. So on her purchase orders, she wants ABC Consulting showing as the name, but on her 1099, she wants Fran Smith showing. So this is an example of what it looks like in USAS web. I've got a screenshot of USAS web here. Um, and so she's got ABC consulting. So if you look over off here to um, the right, you're gonna see that this is how it's going to appear on the 1099s, uh, or I'm sorry, on the uh, purchase orders. So this is basically what it'll look like on the purchase orders. Um, but on the actual 1099, it goes to that second name field, sees the 1099 colon, and I'll strip that off and place Fran Smith on the 1099 record. Now I know that I've had, you know, people say, I don't like it to show 1099 Fran Smith on my purchase orders. Well, then this can be removed throughout the year. And then when you're ready to do 1099s, they can add the second name field with the 1099 colon for 1099 purposes and then take it off again for the next year. Um, this is just showing you some of the information that it's looking at when it's generating the 1099s. And I do have a screenshot of USAS web here, which like I said, doesn't include the tin type. So um, that's one more thing that needs to be uh, remembered. Um, I should have had a then screen screenshot here that probably would have been better. Um, but you'll see, you know, what it's looking at is looking at the name and second name fields, obviously. And it's looking at the 1099 information, the 1099 type, the TIN type and uh, then screen and the ID number. Um, it may also be looking at the override flag. So if you want to create a 1099 for a vendor that's under the $600, um, then you can check the override flag and it will it will create a 1099 for that vendor regardless um, of the amount. And then um, year to date totals are over there. So it's looking at that calendar year to date amount and um, that's what's going to be placed on the 1099. So 
if for some reason this amount isn't correct, um, maybe a certain percentage of that is to be sent to the IRS, this is the calendar year to date amount is a modifiable field. So they can go in to um, UCS web or into Venn screen, make a change to that. And like I said, whatever is listed there is what is going to get pulled into the 1099 program. Hey, any questions regarding uh, 1099s, um, the actual vendor portion of it? Anything here in chat? Okay, we'll go through the month and closing steps. Now, for those of you that have been at the ITC for a while, you can probably take a short nap. <laughs> but for those of you um, that are new, um, and uh, this is your first go around with uh, classic reporting, I'm going to take you through the month and steps. Um, so first, you're going to proceed with closing out for the month of December as normal. So obviously, they're going to enter in all their transactions for the current month. We'll get everything in there for December and perform their bank reconciliation procedures. Um, districts, you know, pretty much have their own, um, but we do have a section out there in the user guide um, that details um, a bank reconciliation. So they want to um, examine the reports to make sure that they're in balance. Um, so the cash reconciliation is in the USA EMS EBT program. And so um, that's option one in there and they can go in and uh, create their cash rec for the month of December. Um, they wanna go out there and run a PO detail report of their outstanding purchase orders and just to make sure that all looks good. And they can also run a bell check. Um, and so what they're looking at the bell check and we don't have like a bell check in the redesign but because they're stored amounts in Classic, it's gonna go out there and ensure that month fiscal and year-to-date expended amounts are the same on cash appropriation uh, budget and revenue, you know, as well as the received amounts, the cash and the revenue amounts are identical. So it's looking at those timeframes just to make sure that all of that's in balance and also it's, it has an outstanding um, encumbered amount on the bell check and they can take that and compare it to that PO detail report they just ran to make sure that those amounts match. If they don't, we do have a program called fixed encumbrance, F-I-X and C, that can go out there and recalculate the encumbered amounts to ensure that they match. If they don't and you guys aren't sure how to fix it, that's when you can create a ticket to us and we'll help you guys out with that. They run a, want to run their FinSum, which is their cash report. And in FinSum, there's an option to generate the financial detail report at the same time. So um, the current fund balances on each of these reports should match. So what happens is at the end of the report, they get a total amount um, of the FinSum, uh, current fund balance and the financial detail current fund balance and those should agree um, if they don't they'll get a message saying they don't balance and we need to look into that to see why they aren't balancing they should they, they should be making sure those amounts balance before they close for the month um, so again if that's something you guys are um, needing assistance with you can create a ticket with us and we'll help you out with that um, the sm2 calc uh, tracks the SM12 figures. Um, it is an optional step that they can run that beforehand. And uh, I know that uh, districts do use this for part of their board reports. Um, so they can go in and uh, run that ahead of time and it'll produce a report that they can review. If they don't run it ahead of time, that's okay because when they run adjust for the end of the month, it runs the SM2 calc automatically. Um, so that's what that option does. Um, and then they'll go in and run their monthly CD for December. So at that you know, point, it's generating the December month end reports. Um, and then we also have a listing here of other minimum month end reports that they can run. So a lot of these are already on monthly CD, uh, but they can go in and run those as well. 
and any additional calendar year end reports. We don't have a calendar year end report bundle like we do with redesign and classic. Um, so we just have the monthly CD and we have the fiscal year end uh, link. So um, if there are specific reports that they want to run for calendar year end, um, they would need to do those manually. Um, also, um, you have an option as an ITC to generate a copy of the calendar year end files if you so choose. So you can do that as well. Um, one of the other things that uh, you can do at calendar year end time is if your districts are tracking the Venn Hire information, we do have a reset option in Venn Hire that resets all the vendor flags um, from reported back to reportable. So if you have vendors you know, that are being tracked in Venn Hire and you use them every year, um, when you reached that point that they qualified uh, to be submitted to the um, vendor, the new hire reporting center, um, I think it's a $2,500 threshold. And so if you generated the report after they met that $2,500 threshold, um, that report would have set the flag on the vendor record as reported so that they don't get reported again throughout the calendar year. Well, now we're at the end of the year, we need to set that back to reportable for the new calendar year. And so with that, then they would need to go in and run this um, reset flag, the VH reset option, and that vendor is basically ready to go uh, for the new year. And the last step um, as part of uh, the month end closing is to run adjust for month end. So obviously um, shouldn't be running any programs during the time that they're running adjust. And so December's officially closed, uh, but now we're ready to um, start doing calendar year end processing steps. So the next thing is to run the F1099 program, which creates this, the 1099s for the current year. And we did make changes to this last year. So when we covered the calendar year end uh, review last year, we didn't have these changes in place <clears throat> yet. So um, this PowerPoint looks a little bit different than last year's. And so you'll notice that um, the, uh, there are three different options that they can choose from when they're ready to generate their 1099s. So they have the ability to generate just 1099 this or generate the 1099 neck or they could do both, which I assume most will, is, is use the both option. And so this is basically just the prompt. And what I did is I just put in a question mark there to make sure what I knew what each one of these were. And then basically I'm going in then and putting in which file, which option I wanna generate. So I can enter in a B and it's gonna generate the, the neck and the misforms all in one, uh, file. So let me go into these here. So if I were to just choose the M option, what all does that include? It's going to include the vendor 1099 types of rents, other income, medical and health care, royalty payments, and attorney gross proceeds. And these are the output files that get generated then. So we have a 1099 miss gap file. And this is the file that can be used with a third party printing software. I believe um, you all are printing um, for your districts. And I believe that you are all using Edge's accountability software to do that. Um, so the DAT file is what you're going to be pulling into their software to print the 1099s. So if you're just wanting to do the 1099 miss, then um, you can generate it with just the M option and that DAT file is only going to contain the miscellaneous uh, type uh, vendors. There's a F1099 underscore miss dot FRM. Um, this is um, a form file um, containing uh, the 1099 information. I don't, I'm not aware of anyone using this form file anymore. We used to use them when uh, we had the pin fed forms back in the day. 
um, I believe that all of you are using the DAP file um, in order to merge it with um, accountability software for the mouse. The F1099 underscore miss.txt file is the report. So that's the actual report containing all the 1099 miss vendors. And so this is something that you would probably want to print out to review to make sure there aren't any errors for any missing tin types. And also um, to um, have, a, has it, have it as a reference and sent to your district so they have a copy of the report. Um, obviously, they should be running this, you know, making sure that everything looks good before they do their actual generation um, for their 1099s. So it's just a standard text file report. The F1099 miss.tape file is the actual tape file containing the information to be sent to the IRS. So that, those are the tape files that you're going to be appending at the end um, and then appending them into one file and that file then will get submitted to, uh, it'll be run through um, the uh, TR1099 program and then that file then will be submitted to the IRS and I'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, so again, this is just if you use the M option, these are the output files you're gonna get. If you use the N option, it's only gonna pull uh, vendor 1099 types of non-employee compensation. So again, same type of thing. You got your DAP file that can be used with the accountability ed software. You've got the DAP form file, which I don't believe is used anymore. Um, you've got the actual report that contains your 1099 NEC vendors. And then you have the tape file again, which contains just the 1099 NEC vendors on it. So what I believe most people are, are using is the both option because it has both the NEC and the 1099 information in the same file. Um, and so this is probably the one that's going to be run. And what this is going to do then is, um, I believe that on the DAP file, the miscellaneous vendors will be listed first and then the NEC vendors. So that's kind of how you're going to see it. So the miscellaneous vendors will be by, you know, the different um, income types and stuff, and then, and then your NEC vendors. Um, the form file we'll, we'll kind of skip over. Um, the text file is the report. So your again, your miscellaneous vendors will be listed first, totaled by the 1099 income type, rents, um, health payments, um, and then the neck vendors with a separate total. So, and then there will be a grand total at the bottom of the report, um, combining both the miscellaneous and the neck vendors. So that's how that report's going to appear. The tape file then is going to contain both the 1099 miss and 1099 neck information. And that's the file then that will be appended um, and then run through the TR-1099 program and submit it to the IRS. So um, I believe that your districts will be running the F-1099 both to get everything in there. Um, and I will, you know what, I'll stop this for a minute and just kind of show you a run of that so you can kind of see what this looks like. So I'm going to <clears throat> end the PowerPoint for now. And I'm going to go into my. So for those of you that are new and, you know, aren't real comfortable with the 1099, I just kind of want to show you what this does. And so here is the F-1099 program. So I'm gonna say, yes, this is the correct program. And then it goes in and pulls the data from USA Con, um, what's on that treasurer's address um, in there. So it's just pulling in the EIN and that information. And then the amount for reporting, which just use the defaults. And do you want to uh, report with no ID numbers? The defaults, no. And I would recommend to leave it as that. So you should have their um, ID uh, information on there. Um, you want to utilize <coughs> the check name and addresses. So if you wanted those on there, <clears throat> I'm going to put in 2021 for the calendar year. Do you want to create the tape submission file? 
So like I was saying before, if they're just testing out and running F1099 just to make sure they don't get any error messages, they can say no to this now. Um, and um, it won't create that .tap version, but it'll create the rest of them. Um, but, you know, it doesn't hurt to run it multiple times as well either. Um, but, it, you know, if they're just doing just their dry run to see how the report looks, they don't have to say yes to this one. And then here is the uh, prompt that changed last year. So do I wanna, what do I wanna choose? Miss, oh, the miscellaneous, the non-employee compensation or both? I'm gonna say both. And skip over to payer control, gives me a little review here. Do I wanna print a dummy alignment form? Gosh, I hope not. I hope no one's using PID then forms for this. And then what it's going to do is it's gonna generate my output files. Um, and also if I had errors about missing tin types, I would have received an error in here as well saying this vendor doesn't have a tin type. Um, and then I would go to my report to view that to see which ones are missing. Um, but I'm just gonna go ahead and show you the report. And so here is the actual report then. And so it's going to give me um, my miscellaneous ones first. So I've got some medical and health uh, vendor, I've got a rent vendor, and then it goes down to my non-employee compensation as well. So any questions regarding that option in um, classic, the F1099 option. Looking at my chat here. Okay. And so once they've completed their 1099s, um, that's, you know, as well as the VH reset are probably the year end um, steps basically in USAS. So they can run adjust again from their normal account, select year end, and they'll have two options. There's a fiscal and a calendar. So obviously they're going to want to run the calendar and obviously they can't be running any of the programs while they're doing this. And that will officially close them out for the calendar. And what that's doing really behind the scenes is it's going out there and clearing those calendar year-to-date amounts on the account file and also clearing the vendor year-to-date amounts on the vendor file. So it is going out there and doing a lot of work, you know, making sure those are all cleared and ready to go for calendar year 2022. So once that's done, they can begin processing for January. Um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is the 1099 submissions to IRS. So um, if you're electronically submitting your 1099 data on behalf of your districts via the IRS's fire system, we do really recommend that you set your own deadline with your districts. Um, the deadline to submit the NEC information is January 31st. So I think all ITCs have a mindset is let's get everything done. Miss NEC everything done at the end of January and have that in it submitted and we're done with 1099 reporting. And so if you, know, you have that hard and fast deadline of January 31st, then you need some time to get that information from your districts so that you can print off the 1099s and submit the data. Um, so we strongly recommend, you know, you give yourself enough time and give your districts a deadline to say, listen, we, we need the 1099 information by this day. Um, so that's, yeah, a strong suggestion on that one. Um, the instructions, we have a link down here for the instructions for 1099 MISS and 1099 NEC. So this link will take you to those instructions that are out there on the IRS's website. So after a district runs the F1099 program, um, we just wanna ensure that all of those files were created properly. So we wanna make sure that the pay file is included with that. Um, you, the ITC, you guys may have a procedure where you rename the files to a different extension in order to save them um, later or to archive them. And then that DAP file, like I said, is going to be used with the EDGE software to generate the forms. Um, 
I know last year, I'm gonna look here, I've got some notes. Um, last year, uh, their accountability software was able to handle the separate 1099 MIS and 1099 NEC data. Um, so if you are creating the both, the both um, DAT file, then um, what happens is when you submit that then and run it through their uh, tax preprocessor, it's going to determine which is the file, what's in the file, and it's going to split them out um, according to what type they are. So um, I think here, let me look here. I did ask Liz Watson, and I think I sent all of you an email not too long ago, just saying, are the form files the same? Um, and she said, yes. Um, and so um, as to the same procedure, I never um, confirmed that, I'm assuming that. So if you guys need to confirm that information with EDGE, just to make sure it's the same, I, I haven't heard anything otherwise. So I'm assuming it's the same as last year. So what happens is it goes through that preprocessor and it's gonna um, split the file names out according to the date and the time. So if the file contains both types, miss and neck, um, you're gonna be prompted with totals just like last year and they're gonna be separate totals. The total for the miss information and the total for the neck. And so then when you run it through the accountability software, there are gonna be two different form types, obviously, one for 1099 miss and one for 1099 neck. So that process is gonna be the same as it was last year from what I know. And then you will then need to load them in separately. So you'll have a 1099 neck and you'll have a 1099 miss and select the type of form that you want. And those forms will get created in Edge to be printed out. Um, so like I said, I have not heard anything different if you would feel better about confirming that with EDGE, please do so. Um, but as far as I know, they can handle you know, both, they're ready to handle both set of forms and they can pull our both uh, DAT file and pull it in and separate them and, and print out the correct forms for you. Yeah, I think I sent that Ed, or that email to her back in early October about the actual forms and if they're going to be the same. Because I remember last year we had a little hiccup with the neck form, I think, um, and it, the size was changed. And you know, we we don't control that stuff, so we aren't aware of that. Um, and that's why I reached out to her just to say, are the forms the same? And I think I scored that message on to you guys to let you know that um, the forms are the same as last year is what she confirmed. So they're all, um, the 1099 miss and neck are eight and a half by 11 pressure sealed and the W2s are the eight and a half by 14 pressure sealed. So as far as I know, that hasn't changed. So again, if that's something you wanna confirm with her, please do so. So if your IT is, ITC is printing 1099s, obviously for classic um, on behalf of your districts, you can include, um, obviously you're gonna include the pressure sealed all ready to go 1099, um, copies of each 1099. So um, you can produce um, copies. I think you guys are able to go ahead and, and print two 1099s per sheet just so that the district has copies of the 1099s. Um, the 1099 report, that text file, and then instructions on how to distribute the 1099s to the vendors. So that's you know something that you guys take care of and you probably have a form or whatever that you are step-by-step -step procedures on what they need to do. So we don't have anything here at the SSDT for that. Um, so you basically are gonna be following the same things that you did last year. So once the 1099s are generated, you're closed for the year, districts moved on into January. Um, the next step to get everything ready to go is the TR 1099 program. So that's what's basically going to get the information ready to go in the format 
to be submitted to the IRS. Now, publication 1220 um, is a pretty important publication that we all need to be informed in, in reviewing. Um, there's definitely stuff, obviously, for software developers like us that we need to look to see if there's any changes. Um, but also, I think it's nice for each ITC. I know, you know, working um, you know, at Nawaka, this was one thing we always looked at just to see, you know, what's new for the tax year. And so this is where we get the information about the TCC codes and what they need to do in order to create um, or apply for a transmitter control code. So this is a basically just took a snapshot of what they had out there in publication 1220. And this is a link up here as well on the PowerPoint. It'll take you right to it. And so, and these are some of the things that um, Kat had mentioned last week as well for those first time filers that needed TCC code, how to apply for one. Um, so all that information is listed in here. Also, there's a section here talking about the due dates for 1099 miss and 1099 neck reporting. Um, and also an update about the non-employee compensation. This is where I learned that um, they are allowing it this year for combined federal state filing. Last year, that was another little snafu at the end of the year where um, we found out that the non-employee compensation was not part of the CFSF program. That's changed. This year they are. So those non-employee compensations, uh, once they're submitted to the IRS, they then get submitted to the state of Ohio as well. Um, so that's a good thing. So we don't have to worry about any of that this year. Um, and so with that, we have to make changes in order to include that in the NEC information on the tape file. So we do have some changes that need to be made to the F-1089 program in order to get that on there. Um, I'll talk about that here in a little bit, but I just wanted to, you know, inform you that, yes, it will be included um, for the NEC um, portion this year. So if you've never uh, submitted before, a test file is required before the very first submission. So, I mean, if this is your first year, um, then you would have to submit a test file. Um, so for those, you know, and, and that was what Kat had mentioned last year, for those um, districts that are, or last week, those districts that are smiling on their, submitting on their own, they have to uh, do a test submission um, before they actually do their live submission to the IRS. So we've got links here on uh, what needs to be done. So you as an ITC, you know, probably have been doing this for a long time now and doing the submissions. It isn't, and you've had your TCC code forever. Um, so it isn't recommended or it isn't required, but it is definitely recommended to do a test file. Um, and just to make sure that everything looks good and, and working properly. Um, and then we're gonna follow uh, the normal TR 1099 procedures here. So when you're doing the test file, so it has to include one or more districts, 1099 data, so it can't be junk data, it's gotta be real data. Um, and that must be at least 11 vendors, that's the B record on the tape file, um, that need to be included on that test file. And then in the TR-1099 program, you're selecting test. There's original, which is gonna be the actual submission they do in January, and there is test. Um, so you do a test and there's also a separate fire system for the test. So it's a completely different URL and that this needs to be done in November, early December. So right now is when uh, they can do their test submissions. So they will receive an approval letter um, and um, in order, let me just get that in here. So when they you know, file for a TCC code, they're going to get notification that they have their TCC. And then um, when they do a test uh, submission, they will get a notification too if the test submission was successful. That will be something that um, they'll get. So 
So filing requirements, um, we definitely have um, these listed again for when the 1099s have to be uh, submitted. Here is our fire system. Um, the test system availability, like I said, is right now, it's going on right now, and they can submit a test. So if they have their TCC code and they're all ready to go, then they can go in and submit a test. And this is, you know, for, you know, those, I'm, you know, I'm kind of talking redesign here for those redesign districts. Obviously, for, you know, those of you ITCs that are submitting on their behalf, you can go in and do a test submission right now. I mean, like I said, you've probably had your TCC code forever. So you can go in at this time and do a test submission. Um, and then the fire system then, as you can see, is available starting January 7th. So once the test submission's good, comes back, they're closed out for the year, everything's good to go, you're getting the tape files from the districts, then you're ready to actually go in and do the actual submission um, or what they call the original. And then obviously that's gonna be submitted on the IRS's fire home system. So not the test, the actual fire system. And we've got a URL here for that. So creating the transmittal file to be submitted, um, what's gonna happen is uh, before you run TR 1099, you're gonna go in and append all of those tape files. And we have a, an append procedure that's pretty universal um, with, all of our IT, with all the ITCs. Um, and this is basically showing you how to do the append. Um, and so you're basically gonna go in and append all of that information and then at the end, give it a name. So this is the name that then is going to be used in the TR 1099 program. So, and it's gonna contain all of your appended districts in that file. Then you're ready to run TR 1099. So you're going to need that appended file name that you just created you're going to want to give it an output file name, whatever you want that to be. This example here is irstax.dat. That's the file that's going to get submitted to the IRS. Um, and then it's going to go in and prompt you for the transmitter's information, which as an ITC, this would be your information for classic. The type of file, original. Um, the TCC code, so again, I, ITCs have been doing this for a long time and under that same TCC code for classic. Um, approved for the combined federal state filing. So obviously you've been approved for that, you say yes. Um, prior year, you definitely wanna skip that because this isn't prior year. This is, um, this is if you were doing something from a previous year for like 2020 or something like that. Um, so you don't need to worry about that. <clears throat> and what happens then is it generates um, a tr1099.txt file, which is a summary report containing everything on there. And we definitely recommend that you keep this on file, you archive this. And then that, um, that file that got created, um, let me go back, is right here, output file name. That's the one that's going to be submitted via the IRS fire system. So that file is gonna contain all of your districts um, 1099 data that needs to be submitted to the IRS. <clears throat> so again, this is just kind of a review of, you know, where the instructions are when it comes to actually submitting the data um, and then the fire system URL and um, you'll get notifications when you do submit it that it's in progress, that it's completed or if it failed. So you will get um, email notifications and things regarding that. Okay, any questions regarding calendar year end for USAS Classic? <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, Brenda, that's a good question. Brenda asked, can you explain a little more about attorney uh, fees and gross proceeds? And what's the difference? I'm not a tax attorney. I don't know uh, for sure um, on that. I know I have looked that stuff up before and I may even have that on a ticket for, for classic last year. Um, I believe like attorneys, I, I can't really, I don't wanna say, cause I'm not hundred percent sure. I would have to look it up on um, like IRS's website to define that. That might even be on, I'm sure that's listed um, on the miscellaneous or the neck information about which is what. Um, but I know I've answered this question before in last year. So um, I will look that information up. And, but again, I, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I'll see what I can find out about it. I know that fees, like attorneys' fees, what they're charging. I think is with the neck form, but again, I'd have to look that up for sure and see, but you know, it is more of a, a question um, for like a tax attorney um, than for us when it comes to those type of questions. But like I said, I know we've had that before and I can give you the information that I've found in the past and send it to you. Okay, um, I think where I was going with it was right now it's probably set to the attorney information, are we, if we, if the district says, oh, well, it's all service fees. So they're going to have to change it to buy, um, the non-employee compensation? I don't know. That, and that's what I, if I can remember last year, like their service fees, I thought were net. Um, but again, I, I'm not for sure on that. Okay. Okay, I was just reading down on the bottom. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, um, any other questions? All right, I do wanna talk a little bit about um, updates that we made since we um, met um, at fiscal year end time. Regarding USAS, we do have some updated um, fund information uh, that we did back in August. We updated fund cone 584. Um, and also um, we replaced the custodial funds to agency funds for fiscal year 2021 reporting. Um, right now we're in the process of taking those 200 funds and changing them back um, to special revenue for fiscal year 22. So we have a current JIRA issue for that, um, USAS B647 that we're testing right now and is going to be on the December classic release. We are gonna have a release for classic for December. And so currently those 200 funds, unless you know districts are manually changing them back to special revenue, they're still classified because of fiscal year 2021 reporting. Um, so we are definitely going to update the software to make them special revenue just for the 200 funds. So like I said, that'll be out there in the December release. Um, and like I said too, you know, we're working on some stuff for um, the CFSF reporting for the NEC form. Um, and so those changes are going to be made with USAS B650. Um, and so that's going to be on the December release as well. As to when the classic December release is going to be, I don't know yet. Um, so I'm assuming it's going to be within the first couple weeks of December. So, um, so yeah, so that will definitely have the updates regarding the um, combined federal state reporting on the 1099 program and um, changing those 200 fund uh, types back to special revenue. Um, also in October, we um, made some changes and added some new receipt codes. Um, so the description on the 3211 <coughs> was changed and we added four new receipt codes per AOS. That was one other thing we made note of um, this past uh, fall. 
updates to classic EIS since fiscal year end. I did want to mention this because you know everyone's starting on the migrations. Is that we did do a change in OECN OOPS back in July. Um, there was um, in from you know very important information that needed to be taken care of with this OOPS patch in order to import um, the inventory, you know, extract the data out of Classic and import it into the inventory application. So we made changes to um, UDMS dictionaries. And we also added a parameter in the EIS extr.com file for um, the EIS CD information to be archived um, so that you can get that information ready to go when you do the extract. And it will contain the EIS CD, but we don't have the EIS CD bundle, you know, that calendar or the fiscal year end uh, inventory bundle ready yet. Um, in inventory, but at least you'll have the data there. So when it is ready to go, um, it'll be in there. Um, so this just kind of has a note about what happened back in July. We had some districts that had issues that either this wasn't done, um, not districts, ITCs had issues with this. Either this oops wasn't done completely or they had a problem with the UDMS dictionary. So you just want to confirm, you know, especially with your tech team about this oops patch to make sure that it was done correctly. I know we've had a couple ITCs that had to redo it um, because of issues with their extract of their inventory data. So, um, so you just want to, I just wanted to put this out there just to make you guys aware that, you know, this was done back in July and just to confirm that that looks good and it was completed by your ITC. Also, um, we did make a change in one of the inventory reports. I don't think we've done that since 1994. Um, but uh, the EIS 101 report had a table limit that was preventing all the acquisition items um, for that particular tag to be reported on the Classic 101 report. So redesign was right. But Classic was wrong in that instance. Um, and so the information was out there. You know, if one item had over 100 acquisitions, I mean, how often does that happen? Apparently it happens. Um, but um, on the 101 report in Classic, it wasn't including um, after first 100 acquisitions, it wasn't including any more of those amounts. They were out there an acquisition transaction program. It just wasn't including anything beyond the 100. Um, so we went in and made a change um, and that was put out there in OOPS on November 2nd, so not too long ago. Um, so this then will allow the 101 report to um, contain up to 999 acquisitions per item. So. Um, so yeah, so we did make a change there on that. Okay. Um, we did have a redesign uh, webinar and that's recorded and out there uh, last week. And I did go in and I'll show that to you in a little bit. I segmented the video out there, the YouTube video we recorded and put links on the agenda from last week. Um, so if you just wanna look at just the payroll portion or just areas of the USAS portion, you can click on that. It'll take you to that specific area of the YouTube video. Um, so you know, if you went through the payroll and you wanna just go to the USAS stuff, you can click on the link on the agenda and it'll take you right to that spot in the video. Um, we're gonna try to do that for some of these combined um, videos so that you guys don't have to scroll through it to get to a certain spot. Um, so I'll show you that here in a little bit. We do have upcoming training coming up here in December. We got to release highlights again on the 3rd. They'll cover everything in the redesign from September to the current period. And then um, Andrew is going to talk more about W2 submission procedures in redesign. I know she went over through some of that stuff last week with you, but we thought it'd be good just to kind of recap some of that with you guys um, on the 10th. And so I just have a link here for the training and also a link here for our calendar year end materials for classic. Um, let me show you here. This. 
and take you right here. I'm on the classic. I'm going to go back up and take you back up to the uh, redesign from last week. I'm just going to go to their information. And so what I did is I went into this agenda and just modified it and added links. Um, so if you wanted to hear about the updates for 2021 regarding payroll, you can click on this. If you want to go right to the payroll calendar and review where Andrea started with that. If you want to go to preparing the payrolls for 2022, you can click right on that. And then I've got some information here with USAS as well. If you know you wanted just to go to the USAS portion and click on that, you can. So we're going to start doing this more, like I said, with these combined sessions. Make it easier for you guys. Okay, and um, just one more thing. Going back to our registration, we're getting very close to the end of the year. So like I said, I, these are the last two sessions we have. So we are in the process of um, working on our schedule for next year. So that should be out here near the end of December with our 22 schedule for our Fridays with Crystal sessions with you guys. Hey, any other questions? Well, that completes the USAS portion. Um, I think we'll take a little bit of a break here. Uh, let's take a five minute break and we'll meet back here about 10.02 and Lori will get started on the payroll classic portion. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to do is just, um, as Michelle had on the screen earlier, is our wiki page. And you can see for the payroll portion, we do have like our, the PowerPoint presentation that's out here. And I did make a couple minor changes and nothing major um, yesterday. And then we have our calendar year and procedures checklist. And again, for anyone new, these are just kind of like a base. Uh, every ITC probably has their own checklist, but these are just kind of like a sample or a base that you can use uh, for your districts. And then we also have uh, supporting documentation, which we have quite a bit out here for W-2s. Um, and I'll be referring to a lot of these documents when we go through the PowerPoint, but this is just um, a lot of documents that you may be able to use. And you can see here that we do have like links to uh, the IRS website for the W-2 and W-3 instructions, publication 15A, publication, publication 15B. So we just have all those out there for you so you don't have to go out to the IRS website. So with that being said, we will go ahead and get started with our presentation here. Go ahead and get this going. Maybe. All right. What's going on here? All right, let me do this. What is happening? <laughs> Hold on, we have someone coming in. Let me get him, let me add him in. All right. And all right, over here, start like that. Okay, this is really weird. It is pulling it up on my other screen. All right, we'll just go through it this way. I'm so sorry. I can't figure out why I can't get it to work on this screen. But we'll go ahead and get started with the payroll um, calendar year and review. Uh, the first thing we'll talk about is the filing deadline for uh, the, uh, the, the, the filing of the uh, W-2 tape submission file. Um, the Social Security Administration is requiring that uh, the W-2 and W-3 information be, set, be received to them by February 1st of 2022. So basically, you at the, as the ITC 
can determine like when you want your districts to make sure that they have the data to you so you can create the files and get them submitted. Um, you know, suggestion is the 27th or 28th. You may want to make it earlier or you may want to make it later. It's up to you as the ITC, whatever you want to do. Um, some updates for 2021 filing. Um, the Qualified Small Employer Health Reimbursement Arrangement, which is basically um, an arrangement for uh, a business that has 50 or less uh, full-time employees. So like it's 130 hours a month, 30 hours a week, whatever. Um, they actually could reimburse them for their health insurance that they pay. Um, if, that, if they qualify for that, uh, the maximum reimbursement amount now is $5,300 for a single and $10,700 for family. That basically is, uh, is reduced from last year from $5,200 for single and $10,600 for family. So that's just a change uh, in the amounts if you have any districts that qualify for that small business health reimbursement. Um, the limit on the health flexible spending arrangement for 2021, uh, a cafeteria plan only allows $2,750 to be uh, reduced from a salary yearly. Um, if anyone had over $2,750, that is going to be reported as wages for uh, taxing purposes. So taxes will be withheld on that over, over withhold, with overpaid amount. Um, for flexible spending. And one thing to know, if the salary reduction uh, limit of 2750 was um, included in a carryover from the prior year up to $550, that will not be included. And then if districts have questions about that, they're probably going to need to contact your uh, tax advisor about those questions. Um, in Classic, we have the W-2 MATE program, and that what, is, what that is used for is a district can process the SSA EVS, which is a uh, option in the W-2 MATE program, and what that will do is create a report with all employees and their social security numbers listed, and then that report can then be um, submitted to the SSA. So when they process that SSA EVS, a report called EVS REQ2K.SEQ gets created. And then what they need to do is upload that file to the SSA and they, they will get verification for that. Um, the SSA is gonna actually then return a file with any errors to the district, but the file that you get back from the SSA is it's very, it's different in the naming sequence is strange. So normally they get the file back and then it just has to be renamed EVS ver 2 kseq And then once it's renamed that, they can actually go back into the W2 MATE program and run the EVS RTN option. And then we'll ask for that file, that EVS ver 2 kseq And when they do that, it will actually give them the report then with the errors that are, returned, that are returned from the SSA. And then obviously if there are errors, the district will need to get with the employee and try to, to rectify the problem in order to get that corrected before they file the W-2s. Um, another thing before W-2 processing starts is the districts need to make sure if they have school district bed name records, they, they uh, need to go in and make sure that the W-2 abbreviation on those OSDI records contains the OSDI code as the first four characters, and then they can put the name of the school district afterwards. And this just changed a few years ago because a lot of districts just had like the name of the school district and the, and the W-2 abbreviation field. So maybe they had like uh, Wasian. Okay, well, the district also withholds a Wasian city tax. That was causing problems when filing the W-2s. So that's why we're kind of telling them, make sure you have the OSDI code number and then the district name listed. And then they also want to make sure on that OSDI dead name record that they have the OSDI code populated on that bottom left in that field. 
um, for city records, for any city that they're filing electronically, they're going to want to make sure that they have the tax entity code listed. Now, if they didn't have it listed already, that's going to be a problem. Like if they didn't have it listed throughout the year, um, when they get ready to create a W-2 city file, it's probably not going to pull it because the, the program bases off of that tax entity code. So hopefully the districts um, from last year, or if they added a new city, if that city reports electronically, they have that tax entity code listed on that record, on the dead name record. Um, for uh, CCA and reader reporting, they're gonna wanna make sure that um, on, the, on the dead name record, there are certain fields like for CCA or for RITA, um, as far as a RITA code or a CCA code, uh, does, does this report to RITA or CCA? They have to define yes or no. And then they also have to enter the city name in that record. And I'll show you the, a screenshot of what the screen looks like. Um, RITA and CCA both require codes for uh, tax data. So you have to make sure you get the information off of their websites. And when I put links for both of the websites where you can actually go out and find the cities and the codes uh, that uh, coincide with those cities. Uh, we suggest viewing those sites frequently uh, to make sure there's no updates to the cities. And I actually went out this morning just to see if, <coughs> excuse me, possibly they had the 2022 rates out there for their cities, they're not out there yet. So you'll just have to keep checking because um, district obviously will have to make changes if there's any changes for 2022. They're gonna to wanna to make sure they keep checking these sites to find out if there are any changes to city rates. <coughs> and here's a screenshot of what I was talking about. So if it's a RITA district, we have the RITA um, option, then we have the area where you put the code, the yes or no is does this uh, city report to read yes or no and then we have to have the city name listed as well same thing goes for cca you have the same options for cca <clears throat> um another thing on the dead screen record <clears throat> excuse me which uh would be the employee's record we have to make sure that the employee or residence field is populated. Now, more than likely, if, you're, if your district uses uh, the business gateway and uh, adds um, city taxes uh, to the business gateway, it possibly could already have that because that is helpful on the report, report as far as like, like on the deduction report, as far as like how much was withheld because they're a resident, how much was withheld because they're they're uh, an employee of the district. So in either case, for CC and RITA, those, that field definitely needs to be populated on a dead screen. So just make sure that that is done. And um, to see information regarding the details as far as like, how do I determine if it's employment or if it's a residence, you can go out to those websites, uh, the links that I have listed there, and that will give you more uh, detailed information regarding that. For CCA, the district just wants to verify and make sure that the address of further employees are, are correct for CCA reporting. Um, you can have the district verify that they're adhering to the US, uh, USP or the post office standards. Um, and we have a link for that as well listed here. <clears throat> for CCA setup, they're a little different <laughs> than Rita. Um, they, they, they require like RS or like state records be included in their tape file, as well as like any other municipality that pays that the, that the employee may be paying into. Now, if by chance the employee pays into a CCA city and that CCA city um, for the, uh, they have, I can't even spit it out here. If the CCA city is on the appendix A. Obviously, the CCA information, the code, the yes report to uh, receipt, report CCA on the dead name and the, and the city name need to be on that dead name record. But if for some reason the employee also pays into uh, maybe it's a RITA city that is also on or maybe uh, acknowledged 
by CCA, they could be listed in Appendix B. So with that being said, on the dead name record, the CCA dead name record, you're, you're going to have the CCA code, the um, yes or no defined, and then the city name. But you could also have the RITA code because CCA has a code in Appendix B associated with that city. And then you also have to put the city name. But as far as like reporting to CCA, that would be left blank. Um, it's very confusing. <laughs> and so we kind of tried to uh, spell it out here in the in this information. And if the district really has major questions, they're probably going to need to speak to CCA about it because we only can, you know, give information as far as like what we understand CCA is doing. But, you know, if they want to vet, verify and make sure that they're reporting correctly, they can contact CC and make sure and double check before they actually create the files. <clears throat> Another thing for W2, before W2 processing, um, if they have HSA set up, obviously, more than likely, they've been probably withholding it for, throughout the whole year, but got to make sure that the, on the dead name record that the uh, uh, annuity type is set to an I because that is set as a section 125 as a health savings account. So you want to make sure that that is out there correctly for reporting on W2. Uh, we do have in that documentation on those uh, other, uh, other documents that we have, we have an employee expense reimbursement doc document. And what that is for is like if the district paid an employee through a warrant check possibly, but they want that information to appear on the W-2 as wages. There are certain things that have to be done um, with that employee's records in order to get that processed and put on the W-2 accordingly. So that reimbursement document gives you several different scenarios and what all needs to be done as far as processing in order to get that information on the W-2 for the employee. Uh, moving expenses is, is another thing that is included when they start processing W-2s. Um, keep in mind that uh, the, the moving expenses are only for active military. From They made a change to so like anybody from anything from 2018 to 2025 is only for active military. So if by chance your district has an active military employee and they paid for moving expenses for that employee, obviously this is going to apply to that, that employee. And if it does, they're going to have to actually go in and enter the moving expense information on the 001 uh, federal deduction screen record. Um, again, this is something that we suggest contacting the legal advisor for if they have questions on it. Another thing is the fringe benefits. Those get reported at W-2 time. Um, again, we always tell districts, contact your legal advisor if you have questions or if you're just not sure about something. Um, an example here would be if the district paid an employee tuition reimbursement. Um, right now, the tuition reimbursement maximum is $5,250. Anything above that, so if the district paid the employee more than the maximum, that's going to be considered a fringe benefit and that would be subject to tax, uh, regular taxation. So with that being said, if they pay the employee over the 5250 maximum amount, they would have to go in and put the over the amount over 5250 in the fringe benefit field on the federal deduction screen record for that employee. Um, another thing uh, that we have to consider is the life insurance over $50,000. So if your district is paying for life insurance for an employee and the amount uh, for coverage would be over $50,000, um, they basically have to go in and enter that information in as a non-cash payment. So what has to happen is um, they have to do a calculation. The calculation can, um, there's a table out in uh, publication 15B in section two pages 13 through 15 that explains to them how they will do the calculation. Once they have the calculation and have the, the, the amount determined, um, what they can do is 
go into future or current and enter in an NC1, which is a non-cash wages for life insurance payment. Um, that's going to uh, basically go through the payroll process when they before they process their last pay of December. Now, again, remind your districts if they have anyone that is that qualifies for this, they're going to have to make sure that they put that uh, NC1 payment in before the last pay of December. If they don't, we've got a way to fix it, but this is a much easier way of doing it. And when they process that NC1 payment, what happens is it goes through the payroll. It doesn't give the employee any more money as far as their gross or their net. Nothing happens there. But what happens is it actually gets taxed by Medicare and Social Security if the employee is paying uh, Social Security taxes. But no federal, Ohio, school district, any of that, none of those taxes get withheld. That all happens when the employee files their W-2. Um, now here comes the other part. If the district has a non-cash, an NC1, over $50,000 life insurance that they forgot to add for an employee, maybe the employee left in mid-year, maybe they just totally forgot to do it on that last payroll. They can correct it, but it takes a little bit more work. What they're going to have to do is um, go in and increase the quarter and year to day gross and quarter and year to day taxable gross on the federal 001 deduction record by the amount of the taxable premium. So they have to increase it by that dollar amount. They're gonna also wanna increase the year to day gross and taxable gross on the uh, state record. And then also, if they pay into a municipality, uh, update the year-to-date gross and taxable growth. And the, again, this all is based on whether the municipality taxes non-cash non, uh, non earnings or not. If they do, then obviously they're going to want to go in and enter that information. And then the employee will probably end up paying taxes, you know, when they pay the city or the municipal taxes on that non-cash payment. At when they file their taxes. <clears throat> They're also gonna to wanna to increase the year-to-date gross and taxable gross on the uh, social security or Medicare deduction records. And again, that's going to be uh, inflated by that taxable premium amount. And then what the district's going to have to do is they're gonna either have to get the FICA, the social security uh, uh, amount that was should have been withheld for that non-cash payment from the employee, as well as pay the board portion. <clears throat> and also the same thing for Medicare. The Medicare 1.45% needs to be paid by the employee or by, and by the district. Or what a lot of districts just uh, do is, because usually is a pretty minimal amount, the board will just take care of paying for the entire thing, the employee and the employer portion. And then when you do that, what has to happen is the, the district has to go into the Medicare record and increase the withholding for the employee and the withholding for the board by what they pay for that, uh, that uh, Medicare amount that should have been paid on that taxable premium. And then the last thing that they're going to do is they're gonna enter the taxable premium amount of the life insurance on the quarter to day, year to day, and fiscal year to day amount of the, on the non-cash earnings field on the third screen of job screen. What that does, it basically makes it so um, when they process quarter report and W-2 report and they try to balance, that they balance. Because if they don't add it on the, on the uh, job screen, it's not gonna balance. Your quarter report will not balance to your W-2. So just keep that in mind if for some reason they had to do this and they didn't add that to the third screen to job screen. And then if they're making the correction manually, like we just talked about, they have to go into the federal 001 record and add that taxable, that uh, life, insur life insurance premium amount um, onto the, in the life field on that 001 record. Now, if they process it through the normal payroll using the NC1 paycheck, they do not have to do this. It's only if they did not process it through a payroll that they have to enter that on that federal record. 
Um, for dependent care, if the district does not have a dependent care deduction that they process through each payroll, um, then they're actually going to have to include that on the federal record. Um, there's a dependent care field. They'll actually have to enter the amount in there that the, the employee paid for dependent care. Um, this year, there was an increase. Uh, it's just like a one-year increase for that American Rescue Plan Act. Um, the maximum now is $10,500. So it went from 5,000 to 10,500, but anything above the 10,500, they're actually going to have to pay the tax on, but they'll go in and enter the full amount of the dependent care on that dependent care field on the 001 federal record. And the system will um, process it accordingly. So in this case, uh, 10,500 is the max, they have 11,000. So $500, yeah, 500, had to do my math there for a minute. $500 will end up being um, uh, taxed. A use of a company vehicle. If the district had an employee that had a, a, a lease throughout the year, they're gonna wanna go in and enter that information on the federal O1 record in the vehicle field. So basically they're gonna enter in the lease uh, value I'm out in that vehicle field or that vehicle field. Um, employer sponsored health care. This has been going on for several years, but we just want to make sure, you know, if the district possibly uh, made a change to a deduction name or maybe they changed the code or a number or something, want to make sure that they have that uh, included as employer sponsored health care field on the dead name record marked as yes. The reason being is because that field is used for uh, processing on W-2 information for employer health and inf health information. And one thing to remember is the employer health information is the employee and the employer amounts added together. That's what gets put in or put on the W-2 for that employer sponsored health care. Um, that information goes in box 12 and that uses a code of DD. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if the district only has a medical plan, that's the only thing that needs to be marked as included as employer sponsored health care. If they have life, dental, vision, any of those, and they're not included in their medical plan, they do not have to worry about marking those as employer sponsored health care, only the medical. Um, another thing for the district to make sure is if they do have HSAs, they do not want to mark that employer, include as employer sponsor health care as a yes on the HSA dead name record because HSAs are treated differently. They're reported, again, they're reported in box 12, but they have a different code. A code of W is used instead of a DD code. Um, and again, this just kind of talks about what we just discussed as far as making sure that that flag is set. And, you know, your medical, your medical could be on a regular or an annuitized deduction dead name record. It doesn't matter. Um, you could have, maybe you just have one record set up for employee and employer. Maybe you have two separate records set up. Doesn't matter. No matter what, if you have two separate records set up for your uh, medical for employee and employer, make sure that that field is marked as a yes. And here's the, uh, just a screenshot of where that, what that field looks like on the records. Um, we have an employer health field on the O1 on the de uh, de deduction screen, the federal record. Um, again, that is uh, reported in box 12 with the code of DD. Now, if that field is populated, um, and possibly a reason could be this. Um, districts do not have to do anything as far as like if they have those, the dead name mark with a Y. Excuse me, hold on. My dog is playing with their toys. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, if the district has the dead name record marked with a Y, it's going to just pull that information when they process W2 bracket. If for some reason the employer health amount needs to be different, let's just say that, okay, the employer pays a portion, the employee pays a portion, but maybe the employee pays, 
is off for like three months. You know, maybe that's just part of her job, but she still pays her employee, employee health portion. That amount needs to be included. So what they're going to do is they're going to add the amount from the deduction screen for the employee employer plus the dollar amount the employee paid for their health insurance and add that to the employer health field on the 001 federal record. And again, anyone that has anything populated in that field, that field overrides anything that's done automatically in the system when W-2 proc is ran from the deduction screens. So that will override anything pulled from the deduction screens. And here's just a screenshot of that employer health field on the federal record. Uh, let's see, we keep going here. We talked about all this already. Yeah, we talked about that. I'm not gonna, not gonna bore you with all of that. Um, if a district only tracks the employee amounts, and there are still some districts that do, maybe they just only track the employee amounts in payroll and they pay all the employer amount out of UCAS. They don't track it in payroll. Um, what they're gonna have to do is create a spreadsheet with employer and employee amounts total together. And then they're going to have to import that into that employer health field on the 001 record. They can use USP load to do that, um, but they will have to you know, combine both the totals and then actually import those into that field on the federal record, or yeah, the federal record. Um, that's okay. Um, one thing to keep in mind, I know this is kind of, uh, I'm telling you this because it's kind of almost too late now, but in the past, because really probably no one will be reporting next year, but um, we, we told district if they weren't reporting the, um, the board portion, they, they could have done that by just going in to the dead name record, creating a dead name record for the medical insurance for the board portion but leave the object code blank. So then when they process board distribution, that doesn't get pulled in. That's just a thought. But again, since we're pretty much uh, sunsetting classic, this probably isn't going to apply too much, but that was something that we did tell the districts in the past. Um, we talked about the health reimbursement agreement as far as like if the district has 50 or less uh, full-time employees, this just kind of explains what that health reimbursement arrangement is a little bit. In, in greater detail. And then again, there's a screenshot of that health reimbursement field on the federal 001 record. Um, we strongly suggest that you, you have, you or you have your districts copy all of their files to a D account or an archived account before running W2 Proc. That way, in case there's some sort of a problem, they can always revert back to the uh, original file. Um, if they run W2 Proc at a later time, obviously you need to do that anyway, because what that means is they're going to be using their archive account or their D account to process their W2s, uh, because they have to actually process the payroll for 2022 immediately. <coughs> Um, we suggest that the district run W-2 PROC uh, before their last pay of 2021, just for balancing purposes. And that, actually a lot of districts already do this. They may do it like at the end of every month, at the end of every quarter, but we suggest that they do it, you know, before that last pay. Um, that way they can look for any warnings or errors, get anything corrected before they do their final pay of 2021. And then the W-2 PROC program is used basically to generate reports for balancing. It's also used to uh, create W-2 print forms and W-2 DAT file, the W-2 DAT file, which is used for laser printing. That's what the W-2 PROC does. Um, we have a W-2 city dot, uh, DAT file that gets created for special city submissions. So if you have uh, cities that want to electronic filing. We have a W-2 city program that can be processed for any cities that want to file electronically. Now, this is where the entity code, remember I talked about they had, had to make sure that entity code was listed. If they had that entity code on the dead name record and they used W-2 city, they could go in and enter the, that entity code 
when they're processing W-2 City. And when they do that, it will then find all of those records that relate to that entity code and put it on uh, the W-2 City DAP file. Um, the W-2 tape submission file, when, when processing W-2 PROC uh, to create the, the, the tape, uh, creates a W-2 tape sequential file for, for federal reporting. And then we also now create um, state reporting files. So we have the state of Ohio. Um, the other states, Michigan, Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, those, those will have tape files created if your district has um, you know, employees that pay into Pennsylvania or West Virginia. And the dead name record has that state listed, you know, whether it's Virginia or West Virginia or Pennsylvania. If that is, a, is on the dead name record um, and they pay into that state, then when they process the, uh, the WHO product, those state uh, sequential files will get created. And then when they run WHO product, if the district has any CCA or RITA districts, and they have those defined on the dead name record, uh, RITA or CCA sequential files for W-2 will also get created as well. Um, when the district runs the W-2 product, they have to enter the district name and address. Um, I believe, actually, they don't have to really enter it. I believe it's going to come up automatically off of the uh, USB uh, con screen. They have all that information listed already. Um, but if for some reason something needs to be changed, they can actually type in what they want. And then it'll also pull in the identification numbers, the federal Ohio um, from, again, the USP con screen. Then the user has to decide how they want to sort W-2s. Uh, any sorting is acceptable for electronic filing. Uh, paper filing, which I don't think anyone does, has to be sorted by name. But in case somebody does, that's what has to happen. Um, if your district had uh, third-party sick pay, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but if they had third-party sick pay, when they're running W-2 prod, if the uh, documents that you receive from the, the third-party vendor shows that, in, that the, there were uh, taxes withheld for federal tax, you have to add that uh, tax amount here on the W-2 prod when you're processing um, the district will need to know what kind of an employer they are. Uh, for school districts, normally it's either going to be an S, which is a state and local government employer, and that's a non 501 c so basically a non-exempt. And Or they can use the yes, which is a state and local exempt employer, which they did file for, for a 501c status, so they've received 501c status. So pretty much they're going to probably be using either an S or a Y based on their 501c status. The uh, district has to enter the name, address, identification. We already talked about that. I don't know why that's on there twice. Sorry. <laughs> um, when they're actually processing the tape file, when they initially process W-2 product, they're not going to get all the other information like this. But... Um, I'm going to go through W-2 PAC really quick so you can see it. And um, just like when you're running 1099, you can run W-2 PAC as many times as you want to. Like maybe they need to make a correction. They run W-2 PAC. They can look at it. You, what you don't want to do is there's a, file, a field that says, um, do you want to create W-2s or the tape file? Always want to say no to that until you're actually ready to create the submission files. So when you are when you say yes to create the submission files, you're going to get this uh, W two product contact information that has to be populated. It's required. If it doesn't get populated, it's going to throw an error and it's going to be a problem. The district will have to go back in and probably do some reprocessing out of their archive account in order to get that information on there. So I believe it's like the contact name, maybe their phone number and the email address. Those are definitely required. They have to have that information in there. Um, additional deduction codes. So when you're processing W-2 PROC, it asks you if you want, right here, if you want to add additional deduction information, 
um, for box 14. I believe it'll go to box 14. Um, you're allowed to add up to six other codes on here when you're processing this. So uh, an example of some codes might be um, if, if you want the em employee's uh, retirement amount that they paid added, you can add that to box 14. That's an other. Um, if they paid United Way or union dues or uh, uh, oopsie dues, you could enter those particular deduction codes. Um, that way, you know, the employee could say, oh, you know, I paid this much for oopsie dues in 2021. Um, one thing to keep in mind, obviously, like I said, you're allowed to add six other deduction codes. Only three of those will actually be included on the W-2. So let's just say that you added um, you added the, uh, the 590 for the employee's uh, SERS amount that they paid. All right, well, let's just say that you have an employee that had a vehicle lease and they also had COVID for themselves and for others, okay? With that being said, the lease vehicle, COVID, any COVID, fringe benefits are all, excuse me, the lease vehicle and COVID are always going to be included no matter what. And then any of those other ones that you chose will be included. So let's just say you had an employee that had lease vehicle and COVID self, okay? There's two right there. Those are automatically going to be included on the W-2. But maybe, like I said, you included the 590 because you want their retirement to show. That 590 is going to show. So the lease vehicle, the COVID, and the employee's retirement. Now, if you added another one, maybe they paid uh, United Way. When you, you had included that, that United Way for that employee is not going to be included because only three of the options are included on the W-2. Um, when the district is balancing their uh, W-2 report, uh, the total should balance to the 941 as, as reported, the 941s that they processed. Um, the earnings register or the earnings summary figures, um, that's basically showing you the amounts that were withheld from the employees for the entire year, as well as the quarter to date figures. And that would be the year to date totals for um, the, the deductions that were withheld. And you, they're going to want to balance the federal, Ohio, and city taxes and the gross amounts to make sure that everything is matching, make sure everything looks the same. We do have a record. Uh, uh, reconciliation sheet out there in that uh, those specific uh, documents. We have one of those listed out there that basically the district could keep track of like first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, and then W-2 report total. It can do all that with that reconciliation sheet. Um, for the earnings register, when they process that for the year, it's, uh, it will include all of the deduction amounts withheld for you know each deduction, like your federal, your state, any city, everything. It's going to all be included on that earnings register. You'll compare that to the W-2 report uh, deduction withholdings. And you also have your total gross as well. On the quarter report, we have the year-to-date total amount, again, for your federal, your state, all of your particular deductions, all those will be less listed and you're going to balance it with your W-2 report. This is just uh, the W-2 report and that which column should be used for balancing purposes. Um, some things that affect balancing, and we do have a document called Specific Effects Document that's sitting out there that districts can use to look at and say, oh, okay, well, what does this do? What if they have depending on what does it do? Um, you can see here, <laughs> sorry, my dog, I'm going to stop. Okay, sorry about that. Um, W-2 Procure Quarter Report, we can see uh, some things that actually affect the balancing right off the bat, and you won't know that, you really won't know that because it's not on the quarter report. All this will be on the W-2 report, but it's not on the quarter report. And things that would affect that would be like your dependent care benefit over the limit, your fringe benefits, your Medicare pickup amounts, third party sick pay, a use of a company vehicle, employee expense reimbursement paid through war. 
All of those are going to be on the W-2, but they're probably not going to be on the quarter report. So we'll kind of just go over a little bit of um, each of them. So the dependent care, any, like I said, any limit, any amount over the 10,500 limit is going to be added to the total taxable gross field for W-2 reporting. So what it's gonna happen when you process the W-2 report, it's going to appear higher than the quarter report because of the dependent care amounts. Same thing for your fringe benefits. Those also get added to the total and taxable grows on the federal and state records. So the W-2 report, again, is going to look higher than your quarter report. Medicare pickup, same thing, total and taxable gross amount for your federal, state, and your school district, if they pay in the school district, are going to appear higher than on the W-2 report than they do on the quarter report. Um, for cities, if the dead name record, if the tax board amount option is not used, basically the flag is set to no. Um, the Medicare is added to the city total and the taxable gross amounts, but the employee is going to pay taxes after the fact. Um, the district is going to want to make sure that the tax Medicare like a pickup field is marked as yes if the city taxes Medicare pickup. So they can mark that field as yes, even though the tax board amount is set to no, which basically means it's not going to be, ta be taxing those board amounts during the payroll. They're going to have to pay for it when they file their taxes. And here's a screenshot of a city tax record and your tax Medicare FICA pickup field set to yes. If the tax board amount is used on the city record, so basically the flag is set to yes, the tax is going to be withheld during the payroll. So just keep that in mind. Um, one thing to note, the tax Medicare FICA pickup flag is, is, is basically been replaced by that tax board amount field. Um, the tax board amount field basically allows you to enter in like particular deducted codes for board pickup. So example, this is what I'm talking about. The tax board amounts, they have a set to yes. And then we have the, uh, the board pickup or retirement board pickup for Medicare deducting codes listed. It's going to be using that information when taxing during the payroll. And as far as uh, it being included on the W-2 is already being taxed. Taxable third-party sick pay. Um, at this point, if you had an employee who had taxable third party sick pay, uh, you may, your districts may be getting or soon should be getting a document <laughs> stating the amount that the employee was paid for the taxable third party sick pay. Um, that amount is going to need to be, if no taxes were, I should go back, if no taxes were withheld, which normally they're not, the district is going to have to go in and enter the taxable third party amount to the total taxable gross field on the federal, the state, and the school district in, uh, school district records. And what will happen is, again, like we talked about as far as like W-2 report and quarter report not balancing, when they do that, because they're increasing the total taxable gross amounts, the W-2 report is going to look higher than the quarter report because of the infl inflation of those fields. And here's just a document, and we have this document on the, in the wiki, as well as this document kind of showing like the third party sick pay notifications, what they look like. Um, if the third party sick pay is not taxable, um, the district doesn't have to do anything as far as on the deduction records themselves, as far as like adding total taxable growth. <clears throat> nothing needs to be done there. That non-taxable third-party sick pay doesn't affect any balancing. It doesn't affect the taxes. Um, and then what the district's going to do is basically just add the dollar amount on the federal one record in the third-party field on the federal record. But keep in mind, that's not going to make uh, any balancing problems with your W-2 and quarter report. 
And then when they put that amount on the federal record, that gets included in on the W-2 and back to 12 with the code of J. One other thing to keep in mind, um, I just want to talk about the taxable third party. One thing to keep in mind is we talked about federal tax, state tax, et cetera. Well, with, ta with the taxable third party, because nine times out of 10, they didn't withhold Medicare. If they did not withhold Medicare, then the district is liable to pay the Medicare as well as the employee or however the district wants to handle that. Um, and if that's the case, if the district is paying the Medicare and the employee is paying the Medicare or however they determine to do it, they still have to make sure they go into the Medicare record and inflate the employee and withholding and the board withholding so they don't get errors on the um, W-2 error report when they process, because that will be a fatal because the Medicare amount withheld will not be 1.45% of the, of the taxable gross. Um, another thing that will inflate the W-2 report is the company vehicle, uh, the use of a company vehicle field. So if they have entered anything in that field, that will also inflate the W-2 in comparison to the quarter report. Uh, the employee expense reimbursement, like we talked about, if they went in and made some changes because they wanted uh, wages paid through warrant to be included on the W-2, uh, because they made uh, changes that inflated uh, total and taxable amounts, those could also uh, cause balancing issues between W-2 report and the quarter report. Um, some things to check when you're having balancing problems, they can run a check status report to check for any void checks from the, the prior calendar year. Uh, also run an audit report, maybe to see a refund of an annuity that was withheld in a prior calendar year. Um, and also on the audit report, if any manual updates were made to the year-to-date figures, so they could just search for the uh, YTD year-to-date. Um, and see if you know any changes were made. They can sometimes figure it out uh, by running an audit report and looking for that on the audit report. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the W-2 report and just kind of a breakdown of where each field is coming from as far as like the annuities, total and taxable gross, uh, the tax withheld, where all those where all those are coming from within the system. Uh, common W-2 PROC message, error messages, the calculated annuity amount exceeds the total annuities. So basically what that is saying is it's telling us that the total gross minus the taxable gross is greater than the annuity to the year day deduction amounts. Um, so that's telling us that there could be a problem with the annuity amount or the gross of the taxable gross. So what they got it, they'll have to do is man, verify maybe any manual updates or any error adjustment. Again, Auto report is exceptional for finding that kind of information. And invalid SSN will say, hopefully if they use W2 main, they shouldn't get an error like that. Stop. Um, if for some reason they determine there is a problem with the social security number and it's invalid and they get a correct number, they're going to have to use mass change, the change SSN option to update the social security number to the correct number. Another error would be Medicare amount doesn't equal 1.45% of Medicare gross. So that's telling us that the Medicare tax is probably not right. There's something wrong. Uh, you're going to have to verify the amounts, uh, run, a w, or run an audit report to verify any changes that were made. Um, and keep in mind that if this, like I said, normally this is a fatal error. And if it's not corrected, usually the, the SSA will not accept the tape file when you try to submit it. And again, this is how you can verify that there's any discrepancies. Uh, they can run out a report and check Medicare pickup records. Maybe they have pickup. Uh, check the 692 and 694 or 693 and 695 and make sure, you know, maybe they, maybe they had a Medicare 694 record, they had 2.9%. That's going to be a problem. That's going to cause a problem. It's going to trigger a problem. 
So, you know, check all those things out if they're getting an error message regarding the Medicare. And so they're, they get a message about a negative annuity on file. Usually that pertains to a refund that happened uh, in the prior year, from a prior year annuity. So maybe they refunded it this year, but it was from 2020. Um, what they can do if they want to report it as withheld to refund in the current calendar year, they can just go into the deduction screen and then zero out that annuity, the negative annuity amount. And then they'll use the deduction screen and increase the total gross on the federal, the state, and school district and city if they apply, um, and increase the, the amount on the total gross. That way, um, when they process the W-2s, that will get included. It'll be included already on the, on the, uh, on the W-2. And they're also going to want to make sure if they do increase that total gross amount on the deduction screen, that they go to the third screen, the job screen, and increase the year-to-day gross by in there as well. So the two are in balance, the W-2 report and the quarter report. Another error they could possibly get is the retire plan box flag on the federal record is overriding the W-2 proc calculations. What that basically is telling us is uh, the federal record has uh, the flag, Mark doesn't know, but the system is finding active retirement records or vice versa, the flag is marked as yes, but there's no retirement records. Um, the district will just want to verify it, look at it. Um, a lot of times this happens for students. And if that's the case, because students usually don't participate in SERS, if that's the case, then the district doesn't need to do anything. They just need to let it go. But if there is a problem, they need to figure it out and make corrections. Another error is possible error in OSDI gross or tax. And this is really common for employees that have very small wages, uh, but they have an OSCI tax. Maybe they uh, didn't have any tax withheld. Um, usually just tell the district to verify, make sure it looks accurate. And then if that's the case, nothing needs to be done. They can just verify and make sure it's correct before they process W-2s. This is a very common error. The uh, total annuities do not equal total gross less taxable gross. So basically, the calculated annuity amount, the total gross less taxable gross, doesn't match the year to date annuity amount from the deduction screen. Um, so, what the system does is it compares the total annuities from the deductions to the total gross and less taxable gross, and it, it's using the federal record to do that. So, if that happens and they're, they, or they're not matching or they're not balancing out, you're going to get the error. So what that means is there could be a possible problem with annuity totals, the total gross or the taxable gross. Um, this happens, like I said, a lot of times when there's a refund of deduction for a prior year. So if they want that, again, to be included or uh, calendar year 2021, <clears throat> they could go in and increase the, just the total gross on the federal, the state, and then school district and city if they apply. Uh, so that it actually, um, that error goes away. Because what happens is when they do the refund, the tax will grows and, and all that information gets updated, but the total gross doesn't. So that causes a problem with, with, the, uh, with the, the error appearing. Um, you know, if the error happens, it's not a fatal. I think it's only a warning. So, I mean, they could ignore it if they want to, because really the taxable gross is what's used on the W-2 anyway, but it's just telling you, hey, the total annuity that doesn't match, total gross minus annuities doesn't equal the taxable gross. That's what it's telling you. A fatal error that they could see is the employee's Medicare wages are less than Social Security wages. And this only applies if you have an employee that's paying into Social Security and Medicare. Um, so what it means is if the Medicare wages are incorrect or the FICA wages are incorrect, they're going to have to do research and try to figure out what is incorrect and then make manual corrections to get this fixed. And another thing to remember, the SSA will not, will not accept a, a file that has an error, a fatal error such as this. And if they, uh, that happens, the SSA is probably going to contact them. Um, if the error doesn't get fixed. So they're going to want to make sure if they have that, that they fix it. And it probably is not going to happen very much because usually 
you only have maybe like board members or someone like that that's paying into Social Security anyway. Um, we have, a, uh, in our documentation, we have a document out there that explains that all the W-2 prep errors. And I uh, have the link listed here for that if you want to uh, go out to that and take a look. Uh, again, we have the IRS uh, uh, specific details for W-2 and W-3 reporting. We have that document out on the wiki. Um, I'm not going to bore you with all of these, but um, I do have just a listing of all the different uh, things that are on that, uh, the W-2 instructions and where they can be located in that document, like corrections can be found on page 26. Um, it just kind of gives you a, de a detail, like as far as like maybe deceased employees, all the information regarding that is on page eight. So again, uh, we go through like where uh, specific things can be found in the uh, in that uh, W-2, W-3 information from the IRS. And again, I'm not gonna go through this all with you because obviously you can read <laughs> and you really don't need me to read all that to you. Um, we do again have the publication 15B listed out there. You can print that off if you wanted to off, out of the wiki or you go out to the IRS.gov and get that as well. And here's some more information regarding um, where things can be located in, the, in that document. Um, if you have a lost W-2 form, um, that information is found on page 11. The district can hand type the new form and then enter a reissued statement on a new copy. And again, here's more uh, information telling you where things can be found with pages. We do have a document out there as well in the wiki that lists all of the boxes on the W-2 and what those boxes contain. So that's kind of a nice little thing too, if you want to know, you know, what is box E or whatever, that, that document will tell you that information. This just gives you all the codes for box 12, what they are and what they mean. Box 13 information as far as uh, retirement plans. And then the other, which is box 14, and that we talked about earlier, as far as like being able to add six other deduction codes and how vehicle lease and any of the COVIDs will automatically be used first, then anything entered after that, up to three, up to three, three options will be in uh, box 14. The W-3 form is not required unless the district files on paper. Um, that actually gets included when they run W-2 Brock, all that information are, is on, um, is included on there, so they do not need to uh, process anything as far as a W-3 form or, or fill out a W-3 form. That's all included when they process W-2 PROC. If a district calls and says, hey, um, they told you, hey, my W-2s are done, you have the tape file there, but you haven't submitted the files yet. If they call and say they want to make a correction, it's up to you as the ITC, your discretion, discretion, if you want to allow them to fix it in the system, rerun it, and then submit a new file to you or submit the new file. Um, if they do, um, you can basically have the district restore the copy files, uh, make the correction, rerun W2 proc, and then the new file, the new correct file is out there. And that basically means, yeah, you guys will have the correct file when you do the submission of the W-2s. <clears throat> if you've already submitted the W-2 files, then the district is going to have to file a W-2C and W-3C for that particular employee or employees. Um, we do have a W-2C program in Classic that they can run. It just makes it a little easier for the district to uh, uh, work on creating the text file, or you know, it, it creates a text file and it, it's um, not used to submit, but they can actually use it to fill out the W2C form. Um, the W2C program was initially created to match uh, pin fed forms, and obviously we don't use those anymore. I'm sure no one does but at least they can still run it if they want to get updated information. They can definitely do that. 
Okay, preparing for 2022. Um, the district's going to want to go out and again, for their city rates or school district rates, I have the links where they can actually find the uh, rates for a particular city, those particular cities that they're looking for. Uh, if there's a change, they're going to have to go in and make sure that they get those entered before they start processing payroll for 2022. Um, also, same thing goes for your CCA and RITA cities. They're going to want to go out to the CCA or RITA website, verify that there's uh, if there's changes, and if those there are changes, they're going to want to make those changes on the, the dead uh, dead screen records. Can't think here for a minute. Um, if a district is unsure if an employee should be taxed, uh, they can go out to the Find Your Tax Ohio for a school district and click on that and look up the tax rate uh, by their address, zip code, or if you know the latitude and longitude, you can enter that in as well. Strictly up to you or them. I should say them, not really you. Um, if a district has to make changes to the deduction screens for a city um, or OSDI withholding amount. Uh, we have the change debt programming classic that they can use. They can actually go in and run that and use option C, which is employee or board amount option. They're gonna go in and uh, make the change, tell it what the new percentage is supposed to be. When they do that, it will then change all the deduction screens for that particular city or school district to the rate that they entered in when they're running change debt. Uh, the rate of filing requirements, uh, I have a link out there, but uh, any employer that issues 250 or more W-2s during the calendar year has to file electronically. And they have to use the EFW-2 format that is out there on the SSA website. Um, if a district submits a CD or USB drive, they're automatically going to be destroyed. They will not accept them. They have to be filed electronically. Uh, they do have a, a W-2 test application to test the submission of the file. Um, if not, they could log into the account and submit the W-2s that way. Um, if they use the, uh, hold on, what am I doing here? Okay. There we go. If they use that test application and the file validates, um, the W-2 file is going to automatically be submitted. So that will automatically be, go out there unless they want to you know, go into their account and then do the submission option that way. Um, the CCA filing requirements, again, I have the link out there. Uh, but conditions for required, are, uh, required magnetic media is required for uh, anyone who meets uh, one of the following requirements. Uh, and again, 250 or more employees uh, has to be filed electronically. Employ employers who withhold CCA tax for 100 or more uh, and are filing W-2 information on magnetic media with the IRS, which most districts are doing, uh, are going to have be required to file electronically to CCA. And then again, they use the same EFW2 formatting as Rita does. And then if the district, if they need to file online, they're gonna to have to make sure that they're registered on the CCA site. They may already be registered, but if not, they're gonna to have to make sure they get registered in order to be able to have their file submitted. And how you guys wanna do that is up to you, whether you want to submit the file for them, or you just want the district to be able to go out to CCA and submit the file. It's strictly up to you. Um, updates for 2021 electronic filing. Again, we uh, create files for West Virginia, Kentucky, Michigan, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. So when W-2 PROC is ran, like I said, if there's any instance of any of those other cities, if there's any, any employee that pays into that and they have the information correct, uh, a W-2 and then the name, the initials of the state, that SEQ file will get created. So West Virginia requires um, an output file or a magnetic file if 25 or more W-2s are being submitted. 
if less than uh, 25, then they can still submit on paper uh, and they don't have to submit on electronically. And again, if W2 PAC is granted and encounters a West Virginia employee, it's going to create that West Virginia sequential output file. And they want to make sure that the dead name record um, is set up as the other state. And then WV, which for West Virginia, has to be added in the state field on, for the address. And then the, also the state ID is required on that record. And here's just a screenshot of that West, for, like West Virginia dead name record. So you got to make sure it's set up as other state, the state ID, and the, the state needs to be listed as West Virginia. Um, for West Virginia, if there are any West Virginia employees, W2PROC will ask at the end of each quarter's tax, excuse me, will ask for the end of each quarter's tax due. It's going to ask for first quarter, second, third, and fourth tax amounts. I will also ask for the total tax due. Uh, the number, those numbers have to be entered in whole amounts, whole numbers, but cents can't be entered. So basically just, you know, $50, 50. No cents can be entered. And what we suggest is that the amounts be found on the quarter report for each quarter. You should be able to find those dollar amounts. And this is just what it looks like when you're running w 2 and that West Virginia, West Virginia information pulls up. You have to enter in the dollar amount in whole numbers. In West Virginia, uh, we do not create the RO and RU records. They don't need that. The RE, RW, RS, RB, and RT records are all created when w 2 practice ran. And so we have a breakdown of what each of those is. Like the RE record is the employer record. RW is employee record, RS is the state record, RB is the state total record, and the RT is the total record. So when we when we create that, those are the are the records that we include. Kentucky, all employers filing frequencies are required to electronically file and pay income tax for the period beginning on or after January 1st. And if they want to register, if they're not already registered, they can visit the, go to the visitwraps.ky.gov site and get registered to file electronically. Again, same thing applies for Kentucky. Make sure that they have a set up as other state on the record. KY has to be included on the, for the state, and they have to have a state ID entered on that dead name record. Here's a screenshot of a Kentucky record. And again, when W-2 PROC runs, if it encounters um, any employees that pay Kentucky taxes, uh, the W-2 KY SEQ file is going to get created. And here it lists all of the records that Kentucky requires to be on the electronic submission file. Um, Indiana. If an employer has more than 25 employees with uh, having Indiana taxes withheld, then they have to file um, electronically. Um, trying to think here. Da, 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 da. I, just, I just included a lot of the stuff off of Indiana's site. Same thing applies, though, for the dead name record, um, other state. IAN has to be in the state field, and the state ID is required. A screenshot of an Indiana record. Um, and then when uh, W2 Brock runs, if any employees uh, paid Indiana taxes, the system will encounter that and then create a W2 IN.SEQ file. At the end of, um, if, okay, if an Indiana, sorry, <laughs> I had to think there a minute. If an Indiana employee um, any employees are on the W-2 product, it's going to ask at the end um, for the Indiana employer TID and TID uh, lo a location, I believe it is. Uh, we had to ask this when running W-2 product because there are not enough room on the state ID field on the Indiana dead name record. So we have to add that when you're actually setting it up to create your W-2s, you have to include that TID and TID location number. And if the district doesn't have those numbers, they're probably going to have to contact Indiana to get those numbers. And here 
this is just a screenshot of what they're going to see when they're actually uh, creating the W-2. And this just lists all of the records that are included on the Indiana uh, tape file. Indiana also has an Indiana County tax code. No other states have that, but in order to handle that uh, in W-2 and create the file accordingly, we had to, uh, the district has to create a municipality or a city record for the county tax record and put in IN as a state. So basically they're creating a city record, but they have to put IN instead of OH for the city. That way, um, when we're processing W-2, the process is accordingly and correctly. The deduction uh, screen record for your employer, employees that have Indiana County taxes are going to have to have the R for residents listed. So on the net screen record, you have to have that employee residents field populated with an R and the Indiana code in the Indiana W-2 instructions, which is Appendix A in the Indiana W-2 instructions. Um, the Indiana code uh, is going to be put on the dead screen record in the user code one field. We're using that field for that Indiana uh, county code. The codes are uh, currently zero or one through 92. So you have to enter in like zero one, zero two. Is it, you have to enter two digits. Um, and if they want to find the county codes, they can go to this uh, link that I put out there and find the county codes that apply for the Indiana County that the employees in. And here's just a screenshot of what we're referring to as far as the dead screen record, how it needs to be set up for that Indiana employee, as far as the employee residence, and then that code in the code one field. Um, electronic filing for Michigan. Uh, if you have 250 or more employees that pay into Michigan, that has to be filed electronically. Again, set up the name records, other state, MI in the state field, and then a state ID is required, a screenshot of a Michigan dead name record. And again, when, they, when you run W-2 PROC, if it encounters any employee that paid into Michigan, is going to create a W2MI.SEQ file. And these are the records that get included um, in the Michigan electronic submission file. Pennsylvania requires uh, electronic submission if the, if the district has 10 or more W2s. Um, if there's less than 10, they can submit it on paper and no submission file is required to be created if they're filing it on paper and there's less than 10. Um, the employer, employer should visit the E-Tide uh, department's online system basically to create their, themselves an account if they don't already have one for electronic submission. And then they can also file their annual withholding and reconciliation statement as well online. And then it sounds like copies of individual withholding statement W-2s also need to be filed electronically with the form. I'm assuming that's for just, um, yeah, that it sounds like that's just for if they're, if, well, no. I think that's if they're filing those forms on paper. But again, go out to the website and check on them because every state is different. I don't know what the requirement for sure is for that, but go ahead and check that link if you have Pennsylvania districts that withhold Pennsylvania taxes. And then electronic filing for Ohio, um, the Department of Taxation lowered the threshold for electronic filing of W-2 and 1099 uh, for the calendar year. So going forward, any district that issues 10 or more W-2s is required to upload um, electronically on the Ohio Business Gateway. And something I just got an email like two days, two or three days ago, um, they, uh, the state of Ohio wants to help with the requirement for 2021 as far as electronic filing. And so they're granting a filing extension from January 31st to March 2nd for W-2s and 1099 Rs. 
um, the employee rec reconcil withholding reconciliation returns, the I IT 941, IT 942, fourth quarter annual uh, report, and also school district withholding reconciliation returns. So it looks like they're kind of extending uh, all of the year end uh, requirements till, the, till March 2nd. Um, as a part of the new threshold, uh, the department created an alter, alternative W-2 filing approach, um, EFW-2 format utilized over the last two years. The, the alternative approach is called Simplified W-2, um, which uses the CSV file. Um, more than likely, you're going to be creating and using the file that gets created from the system. So you probably aren't gonna have to worry too much about the Simplified W-2 uploading format issue. Um, anyone who has less than 10 and do not file electronically have to file on paper, and they will also have to file an IT3. When you're filing electronically, no IT3 is needed. Again, they have to make sure on the dead name record they have it set up as Ohio, and then OH obviously has to be in the state field. And the state ID number comes from the USB con screen. So they don't have to do anything as far as populating the app. So here is like a dead name record for the state of Ohio. So when they run W2 Brock, again, when they encounter any employee that pays into Ohio taxes, it's going to uh, create the W2OH.seq file for that particular you know, state, which is Ohio probably have quite a few. And then this just lists all of the records that are included on the Ohio uh, file. Um, let's see. Oh, this is just a reminder to make sure that for any of those other states um, that they're using the deduction type other state tax that they're using that, not you know some other strange uh, option for deduction type. And then these are, again, all the names of the state files that get created when W2 PROC is ran. Um, the process to create a W2 mask is similar uh, for, uh, I can't even say this. Pro this is the process to create the W2 mask, which is basically the file that's going to be uploaded to, you know, BSO or your uh, state or thing like that. Um, you have to run the W-2 tape, and then when uh, W-2 tape uh, comes up, ask you for an option. Is this for the master tape file for a federal submission? Is it for the state or all the different state options, RETA or CCA? You have to choose which option you're running it for. Because when you're running this W-2 tape option, you're creating the header and trailer records for the file in order to be able to submit it to the feds or the state or Pennsylvania or whatever state or read or the CCA. You're creating the header and trailer records for those files. And this kind of basically goes through the W tape process. You're going to start building the W2 uh, tape file. And then that's going to uh, create the RA record, which is your header record for your uh, W2 mast file that you're creating. Um, Next, type the following command as you uh, add your prompt. So you're going to basically append any of the file, any of the sequential files from your district. So like you're gonna append the W2, you know, normally like when we used to do it at a walk off, we used to, um, when the district would say, my, my W2 tape file is ready, we would actually pull that file in and rename it like W2, um, you know, what's the WA.seq because that way we knew, you know, this district file was this. And um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go ahead and pull all of those files in for this, actually, hold on, we're doing the state. I am sorry, let me go back here. This is for the state. So we're going to append the W2, let's just say uh, Michigan, mi.seq file. We're gonna call it W2 mass underscore um, mi.seq, okay? That's going to put the RA record in front of the RE record and keep it in the W2 mass uh, Michigan sequential file. 
So then after we've done that, after we've appended all of the Michigan files into one file, we're going to run W2 tape again. We're going to choose the finish option. When we do that, that's going to enter, create the trailer records that go at the bottom or the RF, the final records that go on the file. So now once we've done that, we should have a completed file. Um, this is just an example of the W2, like MI underscore tape dot, dot text. So basically, it'll give you the, the total employees that were processed and the total taxes that were withheld for that particular state. You can see down here, we use West Virginia as this example. And then what the district, what you're going to do is transfer the W2 mask, like we'll say West Virginia, it's a bunch of file that you created to your desktop or a folder of your choosing using FileZilla or some other uh, installed transferring program. And then in Reflections, like, uh, or you can choose, uh, you can use the transfer option in Reflections if you want to. Um, however you want, however you need to get that file to, you know, a folder of your choosing, that's what you need to do. Then that file is ready to upload to the state site whether it be the ITC, you are loading it, or if the district is going to load it, they still have to, you know, transfer that file into, uh, into a particular folder so they know where it's at when they go out to that state site in order to get that, that file uploaded correctly. Um, one thing to note on the quarter report, I, it is going to show the state fields at the bottom of the report. It'll give a listing like your Kentucky taxes and the dollar amounts for each one. Does anybody have any questions over everything we've talked about to this point? I wanted to keep in mind um, when we run, um, when you look at that uh, checklist, there's a lot of things on there. It talks about monthly and quarterly. Those are things that the district normally does every month or every quarter anyway. But it, you know, it still reminds them you got to run this. You have to do this. It's all of that is in there on that checklist. So just to make sure, um, let me go out really quickly, and I'll just do this. I told you I would go in and just show you how W two prep looks when they're processing it. Go back in here, maybe. We got time now. I am so sorry. There we go. All right, so if I go in, I'm going to run the BH2 product. Again, here's your sorting options. How do you want to sort? How do you want the W-2 sorted? District makes a decision. And then this report is for the year 2021. It will default to the current year, but the district wants to make sure that it is actually showing the correct year. Just hit enter. Is this correct? You say yes. Okay, we talked about if the district had any employees who had third party sick pay and federal taxes were withheld. If that is the case, they're going to actually enter the dollar amount for those federal taxes that were withheld by the third party payer here in this field. I'm just gonna just leave it blank, I mean none. Now here's the prompt. Do you want to create W2 tape file? It's defaulted to no, and the district will want to keep this defaulted to no, no, no. I mean, like I said, they can run this as many times as they need to. The only time they're going to change that to yes is when they're truly ready to create the W-2 tape files, the, 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 the city files and the state files and the federal file. They're, when they're ready to create all of those files, they're going to say yes here. Right now, we're going to just say no. A dummy alignment form on my W-2 is yes or no. I'm just going to say no. <clears throat> Okay, after I've done that, here's my report. I created a W-2 report, a W-2 error report, W form DAT, W-2 form DAT, and W-2 city DAT. Uh, the main ones really that the district is gonna look at initially are the W-2 report and the W-2 error. Because if there's any errors, they're gonna wanna look at them and try to go out and make corrections. I'll look here. 
leave that was uh, provided to employees that started January 1st through March 31st. So that actually looks like it can be included on the W-2 for 2021. Um, again, if your districts have questions, I would strongly suggest that they contact their tax advisor. They can go out to this link uh, that gives a lot of information regarding the Family First, or what is that? Family, I can't remember the name of the, yeah, here it is. Family First Coronavirus Response Act. It gives a lot of information regarding that. Um, this talks about the COVID reporting information. This talks about that whole uh, act that was, uh, that was uh, uh, created last year. And then um, because of that COVID pandemic last year, um, in our system, we created three new amounts, basic or new features on the federal 001 record that can be used to report payment for COVID. Um, those three amounts uh, will show uh, on the employees box 14. Uh, the federal deduction screen uh, has, let me see if I got a screenshot, I do. The, fed, the federal all one dash screen has those three COVID fields available for use. Um, the three fields basically are COVID one, which is if they were paid because of uh, they were sick themselves with COVID. COVID two is they were off because they were taking care of someone else that had COVID or they were quarantined because of COVID. And then COVID three is the COVID emergency. And this just, just explains each COVID field. So like I said, COVID-1 is the leave the employees for time off for themselves. And the day, the per day limit was $511 a day, and they can use a maximum of 10 days. So the limit, dollar amount limit is $5,110. For COVID-2, if they took time off to, uh, for someone else, either quarantine or to take care of someone else. The, the per day limit is $200 and the max is 10 days. So the max limit is $2,000. And then the COVID-3 was the emergency time off for family leave. Uh, again, it could be taking care of someone that was sick because of COVID. Um, again, that amount is $200 a day for 10, uh, 10 weeks. And the max limit is $10,000. Uh, both the COVID other and the COVID emergency pay will uh, pay the employee two thirds of their pay up to $200 max a day. So they're only getting two thirds of their pay up to $200. Those COVID fields can be uploaded uh, to, to the dead screen record using USP load if needed. Maybe you have, maybe a district has many people that were out and they don't want to do it manually, they can actually add those through a spreadsheet, through a CSV file using USB load. And then on the W-2 report, this is what the, the COVID field will look like on that report as far as COVID self, COVID others, or COVID emergency. And then the W-2 form text file, this is box 14, it just shows the dollar amount for COVID self, COVID other, or COVID emergency. And then this on the W-2 form, uh, the COVID fields are gonna appear, um, the SE appears for self um, for the sick wages up to 5.11 a day, COVID other appears, and then the COVID emergency appears for $200 a day limit for both. Again, vehicle lease information is always gonna show first. So if someone had a vehicle lease information and they had all three of the COVIDs only, the vehicle lease, COVID self, and COVID other are going to show up. And that we just talked about that. <laughs> and then also it says, if there is not room to print any of the COVID amounts, then a message warning that screen 01 cannot show COVID emergency amount on box 14 will print on the W-2 report. So basically, like the scenario I just gave you, vehicle lease, all three COVIDs, if one of those is not going to be able to be put on there, you're going to get an error, a report on the, or an error on the W-2 report as well as on the W-2 error report.
Um, all three of the COVID fields are auditable. So you can see those on the audit report. The fields are called COVID self deduct, COVID author deduct, COVID emerge deduct. And then again, go to the irs.gov website uh, for the COVID 941 reporting. This gives you information as far as how to report that on the 941. I have the link here on that. Um, and it gives you all the information on how to report it if wages were paid between January 1st and December 31st of this year. I think that's everything I have. Does anyone have any questions regarding this? I know that's a lot of screens to take in, 184 screens to take in. I really appreciate everyone tuning in and your patience. And I'm sure we'll be uh, talking to you soon regarding W-2s. That'll be here before we know it. It's almost time. And if no one has anything else, I think we'll go ahead and say goodbye and thank, you ever, thank everyone for tuning in and uh, have fun processing W-2s.